Happy Easter to you. Uh, our Lord is risen. Uh, he is certainly risen indeed. It is such a blessing to consider what it means for us that our Lord not only died for us, but that he conquered the grave, that sin is defeated, and that our Lord is alive. And the assurance that his resurrection brings to us of our salvation in life. And today here we're, we're going to pause in our First Timothy study, and I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 uh, and a series of verses here where Peter is writing about our salvation uh, and the assurance we have in that. So let's start here in 1 Peter chapter 1. Now let's just begin with reading verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray and thank the Lord for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you that your word reminds us of the life that you have given us the life that is sure. Lord, thank you for paying the price for our sin. Thank you for conquering death. Thank you for the assurance that your resurrection brings to our resurrection and hope of life. Lord, may we live today in view of the, ether the eternity that you have brought to us. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, Peter's opening words here are truly those of worship and praise, reminding us that salvation did not come because of who we are or because of what we have accomplished, but salvation came as a gift of mercy. Salvation represents a new birth, a changing of who we are. Salvation makes us dead to sin and alive to righteousness in Christ. And Peter here linked our salvation relationship to what he called a living hope. And the hope that he had in mind is the eager, confident expectation of life to come in eternity. It is a guaranteed hope found only in God himself. Huh. Amid present and difficult dangers, we are justified in viewing the future with optimism because we are securely attached to the God who is sovereign over the future. Furthermore, our hope is a living hope because it finds its focus in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our living hope comes from a living, resurrected Christ. You know, there are many in this world who have placed their hope and faith in men who are now dead. Dead men who can't hear them or offer them anything. Men who had no power or control over their own life and salvation, let alone the life and salvation of someone else. But this is not our hope. Our hope is a living hope because the one in whom we hope is alive. Jesus is alive. And death is no threat to him at all, whatsoever. Sin and death cannot hurt him. He has conquered sin and defeated death. And not only has he defeated death in himself, he has defeated sin and death for all of us who will come to place their faith in him. 
So our hope is in a living Savior who has full power over life and death. Thus, it is truly a living hope, a hope of life that cannot be taken away. And Peter used the word inheritance here to describe the nature of this living hope that we have through Jesus Christ. And this term inheritance emphasizes the believer's eternal home with Christ himself in glory, which is an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's an inheritance that is untouched by death, unstained by evil, and unimpaired by time. Our inheritance, you might say, is death-proof, sin-proof, and time-proof. And it has been brought to us in the resurrection of our Lord, and is known to us through our faith. In fact, Scripture says here that because of the hope that we have in Christ and his resurrection through faith, that we are shielded by God's power. Shielded means to guard or to watch over. Uh, you know, it describes how a soldier would guard someone else. It doesn't suggest that believers are you know, blocked from pain or difficulty or anguish, but that God himself guards and watches over our salvation, our inheritance and the resurrection that we have been given through the resurrection of our Lord. And Peter was reminding the first century Christians to whom he was writing that even though their faith was met with scoffing, rejection, and persecution, that their faith in Christ was the most certain and secure thing that they had to hold on to. Because their faith was placed squarely on the one who had conquered not just sin, but who had overcome the power of death itself. No matter what the world around us may say, no matter what others may attempt to do uh, to limit or to halt the spread of the gospel, it is of no avail. Because even when God's people suffer, nothing, nothing can change the hope of eternal life that we have in Christ. Because we know that our Redeemer lives. We know that the one who has granted us an inheritance of life can actually give it to us because he himself has opened the door of life and demonstrated his divine power over the grave. And this is the same hope that we have as disciples of Christ today. You know, you wouldn't trust your dentist to pilot your airline flight any more than you would trust an airline pilot to take care of your teeth. Why would you trust your life to one who knows nothing about eternal life, to one who has never conquered the grave. And this is what sets Jesus apart. No other major religious figure has conquered death. Yet Jesus is alive. Thus our faith in him is worth far more than gold, Scripture says here. And you know, my favorite part of this passage is actually verses 8 and 9, where it says there, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Apostle Peter, who had seen Jesus Christ in the flesh with his own eyes, who had passed along to every believing Christian the assurance that it is possible for us to love the Savior and to live a life that will glorify Him, even though we have not yet seen Him. We may not have been there to see our Lord when He came out of that tomb, but that does not change the fact that we have an inexpressible and glorious joy in His resurrection. It is as though Paul is urging us, love Him and work for Him and live for Him. Peter is saying, I give you my testimony that it will be worth it all when you look upon his face. For I have seen him with my own eyes, and I know, Peter says. Remember once, Peter was occupied with the life of a fisherman. But when he met Jesus, everything changed. And eventually Peter came to know personally the meaning of bitter tears and strong weeping after his denial of the Lord. 
But I believe all those painful personal memories that Peter had of his own denials of Jesus were overcome by a far greater memory. That of seeing Jesus face to face after he had conquered death itself. As Peter came to know personally the hope and life, love and glory of his resurrected Lord. So then Peter, as one who has seen the resurrected Lord in the flesh, personally experiencing Jesus' grace and life, was moved to write to us, believers across the world and across time, to remind us that we have every reason to love Jesus Christ today, even though we are yet to see him in the flesh. And we have this love and this joy because of our faith in his life, as it has been proclaimed to us in the testimony of his resurrection. We can worship together because we know that our Savior lives. And we know that there will come a day when we will see him face to face. And that is what Peter means when he says in verse 9, you know, we're obtaining the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. It is our guaranteed inheritance in Christ's glorious resurrection and his victory over sin and death. The culmination of our faith is not the experience of anything in this temporary world. It is the completion of our salvation when we stand before our Savior, forever changed and transformed, fully sanctified and made holy forever in the presence of His glory. The goal of our faith isn't baptism. It isn't ministry service. It's, it isn't any series of right actions, good thoughts, or even warm feelings of peace and joy. Any and all such things are aspects of our faith, but they are not the culmination. In fact, those things are but expressions of our faith in the fact that Jesus has saved us and our confidence that we will be with him forever. Baptism is a step of obedience, a declaration of our faith in, the, in our Lord's saving grace. Any service we offer to the Lord and to others in his name is an expression of our faith that Christ and his salvation is worth more than anything else in this world. And when we submit our actions, our thoughts, and even our feelings and attitudes to Christ, we are likewise declaring that our hope is in Jesus Christ and his salvation alone. Our hope is not in the church. The church is the family that God has given us and called us to, through which our faith in Christ has the opportunity to be expressed to one another. But the church is not the object of our hope or the source of our salvation. The goal of our faith, the object of our faith, the outcome of our faith, is the salvation of our souls through the blood, grace, and glory of Jesus Christ. You know, we struggle with remembering and rightly identifying this though sometimes because we can't quite see our salvation like we can see and experience other things that are right in front of us. You know, I've never personally seen Jesus Christ face to face in any form, at least that I'm aware of. I've never entered into eternity, never been to heaven. I haven't experienced such things yet. And it can be tempting for us to having such little knowledge and no direct experience of eternity, to instead reach for something far less and yet much more familiar. It's the temptation of idolatry, the temptation to take our faith and attempt to place our hope, our aspirations, and our, our goals on things before us that are very temporary. Especially when things in life maybe aren't going our way. Or when our bodies begin to deteriorate, when other people let us down or seek to harm us, when we lose money and possessions, or we feel tired, frustrated, or depressed, it can be so easy for us to take such experiences and assume that because God didn't deliver these temporary blessings to me that I wanted right now, well, I just don't know then if I can trust him anymore. Things just aren't going my way in this world. But hear me. I'm not trying to trivialize or make light of any pain, difficulty, or trial that you or anyone else 
has or is experiencing in this life. But I want to emphasize something here about what Jesus has actually promised to us and what our faith is truly about. Jesus has not promised us in any sense, form, or guarantee of ease or comfort in this life. In fact, Jesus assured his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 33, that in this world, we're going to have trouble. But instead, what Jesus has promised to us is that through faith in his grace, we will have eternal life with him in glory. That is our salvation. It is not a saving from the temporary pain of this fallen world, but a salvation from sin and death into eternal life. Nonetheless, many a person has faded in their faith because they were seeking Christ only to fulfill a temporary need rather than an eternal one, demanding that Christ grant them specific blessings here and now while missing the true gift, the invaluable, infinite, eternal gift of life and salvation that Jesus is truly offering to us. It is a gift we have not yet fully experienced. It is a gift yet to come, yet to be fully seen but promised to us through the word of God. And this gift is the result, the outcome, the goal of our faith. Remember what Jesus said to Thomas after Thomas finally acknowledged that Jesus was alive and had risen from the dead. In John chapter 20, verse 29, scripture says, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The greatest blessing of our faith isn't found in our present circumstances before us, but in the eternal salvation our Lord died and rose again to graciously bring to us. And this is what Peter continues to emphasize here in verses 10 through 12. Let's just read three more verses here. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. All of this has been recorded for our benefit, that our faith might be firm. The entirety of the Word of God has been given to us for this purpose, and so that we might know and understand God's power over life and death, God's true and genuine love and care for us, and God's ability and desire to bring us salvation. Genesis to Revelation testify to the living hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And because of the testimony of God's word to God's nature of grace, brought to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the prophets of the Old Testament and the testimony of the apostles in the New Testament, we can confidently move forward in this life, trusting that Jesus is alive and our salvation in him is sure. Our salvation is the glorious mystery, so to speak. The incredible, awesome work of God's glory that goes beyond our present ability to fully experience or comprehend. The fact that God would choose to love rebellious sinners like us to such a degree that he would die for us, to pay the price for our sin against him, to clear the way for us to come to him. And then rising from the grave, defeating death, which is the consequence of our sin, thus removing sin and all of its power and bringing salvation to a people who are not worthy of it, who did nothing to earn it, and who by his will and grace have become recipients of his love and his life. Wow. This is what the word of God testifies to. And this is the entire foundation of our hope and faith. Thus we have every reason to be bold in our faith because of Christ's resurrection and the security it brings to us. We literally have nothing to worry about in the grand picture. 
because our eternity is sure. Even death isn't a factor anymore. For we have been given life through the life of our Savior. Do you know this assurance today? Do you know Jesus? Do you not just know about what he has done for you, about his death and his resurrection, but do you know him? Have you trusted him in faith? Are you living each day depending upon him and the life he's given to you? We do not live as believers in light of our impending death, but in the certainty of our eternity, knowing our Lord and knowing what our Lord has given to us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for the life and salvation you have given us. I pray now that we would simply depend upon you, that we would trust in you and you alone. Lord, that we would not be a people that live for ourselves, a people that live for this temporary world, but Lord, a people who have a living hope in an eternity that is sure. Lord, help us to look to you today. Help us to rejoice in you today with all thanksgiving. And may you be praised, Jesus, for it is in your name we pray. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ and walk in light of the eternity your Lord has given you.